Greetings and welcome to the Chemistry 222 Exam 1 Review, where we're going to go over some problems which are very similar to things you might see on the first midterm exam for Chemistry 222. And this midterm exam will cover chapters 7, 8, and 20. So chapter 7 was when we introduced Lewis structures, talked about Vesper geometry, polarity, things like that. Chapter 8 was when we compared the valence bond hybridization model to the molecular orbital theory model for making molecules. And finally, chapter 20 was over organic chemistry. So we'll talk about all of these in this particular section. Uh, let's go through and see what's all going on. Assuming that this video is being watched because it's an online class, then again, uh, it'll be over chapters 7, 8, and 20. There will be 20 multiple choice questions, and depending on the exam, three or four short answer questions. And you'll fill this all out yourself and then turn it in by the Friday deadline at 9 a.m. via email. And uh, after I grade it, I will return it to you with a summary sheet which says how you're doing in the class as of this time, I do encourage you to check it out to make sure you're not missing a uh, lab or something like that. And also you can see how you're doing. And I definitely wish you good luck with your studying. If this is a face-to-face -face class and you're watching it, which is fantastic, um, just listen to the instructions which are coming out. If you have questions on this, regardless of if it's face-to-face -face or online, you can always email me. I'm happy to help you with things like that. I know it can be kind of confusing. Uh, and I do wish you the best of luck with your studying. Okay, so assuming there's no more questions, let's start the review. Um, this uh, exam review will be in the process of like an eye clicker set of questions. So I'll give you a question and then I'll wait for some time to actually go over the answer. If this was a face to face class, I would give you time to enter it in your eye clicker. Uh, we're not going to have eye clickers available in this video, but you can at least get the idea and hopefully learn some stuff along the way. So let's start the review. Here's four Lewis structures, and one of the following is not correct. See if you can figure out which one of the structures is not correct. And at this point, I recommend that you pause the video, work on the question, and when you have the answer, you can unpause it and we'll talk about the actual answer. So pause the video now. I'm assuming that you have worked on this question and you're waiting to check out the question and see if you got the right answer and let's get into it. When you're looking for a Lewis structure which is not correct, there's a couple of things you can look for. Uh, you can look for example at atoms that should have four bonds but maybe have three or two. You can also look for things which have maybe five or six bonds which would only have four. Uh, and looking at these four structures, I don't see that in any of them. Like all of them look like uh, they're correct in terms of the basic Lewis structures. Um, a quick overview, hydrogen can only handle one bond. Um, atoms in the third period and lower can have more than four bonds, but all of these atoms are in second period or first period. So that would be uh, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, uh, stuff like that. And of course, hydrogen's first period. So at this point, what I would recommend doing is just going through and drawing some Lewis structures and see if you can figure out what's going on. So for the first one there, N2, there's the structure. Let's see if we get the same kind of structure. So nitrogen is in group five and there's two of them. So that would be 10 valence electrons. We'll divide that by two. This structure will have five pairs of electrons to put around. So when you're drawing a Lewis structure, normally you look for the central atom, but of course N2 doesn't have a central atom. They're both the same. You do want to start by drawing a bonding pair between them. That's the glue that holds them together. That's one of our five pairs. You can put lone pairs around the outside atoms and you want to give everything an octet. So that nitrogen with three lone pairs there, that would be happy. But you can see that now I've used one bonding pair, two, three, four lone pairs. I only have one pair left and we can't have that. All right, uh, nitrogen on the left needs a full octet just like the nitrogen on the right does. 
So at this point, what I would do is start making multiple bonds. I'm going to erase that lone pair and make a double bond. And that makes the nitrogen on the left happier. It now has three pairs, but it needs four pairs. So I'm going to erase that lone pair as well and put a triple bond in between. And my poorly drawn structure there is the same as structure A. So I believe answer A is OK. So it is answer here is not answer A. So let's go to the next one, all right? And that structure is for NO negative one. That's what the negative one means right there in the upper right corner. Okay, so nitrogen is five, oxygen is six, negative one means add one. So I'm gonna have 12 valence electrons, or if I divide by two, that's six pairs of electrons. And again, like before, let's put the N and the O. We'll have a bonding pair connecting them, five pairs left. Um, outer atoms first, one pair, two pairs, three pairs, four pairs, five pairs, and with the six pair in the middle, those are all the pairs I have. Now, if you look at um, this structure, the oxygen again has four pairs around it, but nitrogen only has three. So let's uh, remove one of the lone pairs from oxygen and make a double bond. But wait a minute now, something's a little weird here because NO negative one has a total of six pairs and each nitrogen and oxygen has two lone pairs. So that's four, five, six from the double bond. You can see that the structure on the right there for B has only five pairs, a lone pair on the N and the O and three in the middle. So NO minus is what we just drew very cheesy right there. This thing right there, B, is actually NO plus, like it's two less electrons. And notice how it kind of looks like what we drew for N2, all right? NO plus would have a triple bond between it. NO negative would only have a double bond. So there's a problem with structure B. It's not NO minus, it's NO plus. You have too many electrons if it's a negative ion. On. If it's a positive ion, you're okay. Um, if you do the same kind of thing with HCN on C and CO on D, you'll find that both of those structures are okay. It's only B here which is messed up. It's on a negative charge, it's actually a positive charge. Here's another problem where there's four structures and the goal is to find out which one is not a correct Lewis structure. And like before, what I would recommend is you go through and see if you can solve uh, this problem on your own first. Uh, pause the video and then you can work on it and when you're ready, unpause it. So at this point, why don't you pause the video and start working on the problem. I'm going to assume that you've worked on it and you're ready to look at the answer and stuff, which is fantastic. So again, one of those four structures down there is not correct. And again, there's several different ways to do it. You could go through like we did on the last problem and just actually start drawing Lewis structures and seeing if the structure that you draw is the same as the one that you actually see. But this one is actually a little bit different. Remember that elements in the first and second periods will never have more more than four bonds. Hydrogen will only have one bond and nitrogen, oxygen, things like that will have only four. And if you look at D down there, the central atom, nitrogen, has a triple bond on one side and a double bond on the other. So that's five pairs of electrons total. And nitrogen is incapable of making more than four bonds around the central atom. So definitely answer D here is incorrect. Anything in period two, which is carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, fluorine, etc., they can only make up to four bonds. They cannot make five bonds. Phosphorus, which is right below nitrogen, could make five bonds. Things in the third period and lower can make more than four bonds. But when you're nitrogen, when you're carbon, oxygen, you can only make four bonds answer D is not going to fly. 
In this problem, I want you to determine the formal charge of the three atoms with the arrows next to them. So the oxygen on the left, the carbon in the middle, and the oxygen on the right. And one of those answers is correct. So at this point, why don't you pause the video. You can work on the problem, and when you're ready, you can unpause it and hear the answer. Pause the video now. Okay, I'm going to assume that you worked on the problem and you're ready to hear the answer, so let's start seeing it. So the formula for formal charge, and there's different versions you can use, formal charge equals group number minus number of bonds minus lone pair electrons is the one that I like to use the most. So for the oxygen on the left-hand side with the double bond, the group number is 6. It has two bonds, that's what a double bond is, and it has four lone pair electrons, so it looks like that formal charge is gonna be zero, okay? The carbon in the middle, carbon is group four. That carbon has a double and two singles, so that's four bonds, and it has no lone pair electrons, so that formal charge is gonna be zero. And then on the far right, that oxygen with a single bond, oxygen group six, it has one bond connected to it, and it has six lone pair electrons. So that formal charge is gonna be negative one. So it looks like the answer here is gonna be D, all right? Now, in this version, what I used is I used group number minus bonds minus lone pair electrons. You can also do uh, this kind of thing, which is group number minus lone pair electrons minus half of the bonding pair electrons and that's fine too. A lot of texts and uh, sources will use that and that's totally fine. Just remember that every bond is two electrons. So instead of having say uh, one half of four, I use just two for the oxygen on the left. And instead of having one half of two for the oxygen on the right, I use just one. Same thing, no big deal. Either way you want to do it is fine. Because that ion has a negative one charge, something in the molecule has to have negative one. The sum of all the formal charges equals the charge on the ion. Hydrogen is group one minus the one bond, so hydrogen is zero. So notice that all of those are zero except for that single bonded oxygen negative one. That's good. Something has to be negative one to give it a charge. We're good to go. Using Vesper, which of the following corresponds to the molecular shape of sulfur dichloride, SCl2? And there's five different possibilities there. So for this problem, what I would do is I would draw the Lewis structure and then analyze the Lewis structure for first the electron pair geometry and then of course the molecular shape or molecular geometry. So start working on it. Uh, I recommend you pause the video and when you're done, you can unpause it, listen to the answer, pause the video now. Okay, I'm going to assume that you've worked on the problem and you're ready to hear the answer, so let's check it out. So in a Lewis structure, first count up the valence electrons. Sulfur is group 6. There are two chlorines with 7 each. Group chlorines in group 7. So 14 plus 6, that's 20 valence electrons, or if you divide by 2, 10 pairs. The middle atom is usually the first atom listed. It's always the atom of lowest electronegativity. Chlorine is one of the higher ones, so it's not going to go there. I'll put the CLs on both the left and the right. I'll connect them with a bonding pair. Um, <clears throat> that's two of my ten pairs, so I have eight pairs left. I'll put lone pairs around the outside atoms first, so both of the chlorines are happy. And if I have any left over, and I do, I'll put them on the middle atom. Sulfur here is going to have two lone pairs. So sulfur is going to be the key to figuring out this problem. Sulfur has two lone pairs and two bonding pairs. The electron pair geometry for a four-cloud system like this one is going to be tetrahedral. 
But because we're looking not for the electron pair geometry, but the molecular geometry, if something has two atoms and two lone pairs, if you look in the geometry and polarity guide or online, this is what they refer to as bent. So this is going to have answer B. Bent is what it means in sulfur right here when there's two bonds. The angle is about 109 degrees. Uh, remember, molecular shape and molecular geometry are the same thing just different ways of saying it. VESPER stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Theory. Cool. Based on VESPER, which of the following corresponds to the molecular shape, aka molecular geometry, of the IF2-1 ion? And there's five different possibilities there. So molecular shape again means molecular geometry, and one of those five will represent it. So what I would do on this problem, <clears throat> calculate the Lewis structure, figure out what it is, then interpret the electron pair geometry and molecular geometry from there. So I recommend at this point you pause the video. You can work on it. And when you're ready to hear the answer, unpause the video. Pause your video now. I'm assuming you've worked on the problem and you want to hear how this all works out. So let's get right into it. So IF2 minus 1. Got to count those valence electrons. Iodine is group 7. Fluorine is also 7 and there's two of them. But because it's negative 1, negative means to add. We're going to add an additional electron. Counting up those electrons, 7 plus 14 plus 1, that's 22 valence electrons. Or if you divide by two, 11 pairs. So iodine in the middle, it's the first atom listed, it's least electronegative, fluorine is the most electronegative of all. Fluorines on the outside, connect the outer fluorines to the inner iodine with a bonding pair. So that's two of my 11 pairs, I got nine pairs left. Outer atoms get the octet, so both fluorines here are going to have a filled octet, i.e. three pairs. So at this point, I've got three, six, seven, eight pairs listed, and I have 11 pairs total. So that means your iodine is going to have not one, not two, but three pairs around it. Now, iodine is not in group or period one or period two. Iodine can make more than four pairs, have more than an octet, and iodine does. Iodine has three lone pairs and two bonding pairs, so that's five pairs total. So the electron pair geometry here is gonna be trigonal by pyramid. But we don't really want electron pair geometry. We want the molecular geometry or molecular shape. So at this point, you can either go to the geometry and polarity guide, um, or you can realize that keeping lone pairs as far apart from each other as possible is the name of the game. Lone pairs are big. They don't even like to be next. Electrons don't even like to be next to each other because they're negative. Negative charges repel. If you keep the lone pairs in the plane of the trigonal bipyramid molecule, i.e. like there's like a trigonal planar part in the middle of the trigonal bipyramid, that will keep all of the lone pairs at 120 degree angles from each other. If you put a lone pair where one of the F's are right now, uh, then you're gonna have lone pair iodine, lone pair angles of 90 degrees. You can't get rid of it. And a 90 degree Degree lone pair angle is not as good as 120 degrees. So for all of those reasons, what ends up happening is Fs tend to end up being 180 degrees apart from each other because we have to keep the lone pairs uh, as far apart from each other as possible. And if you have an FIF angle that's 180 degrees, i.e. up opposite, that means you have a linear molecular geometry. Um, down there is a picture that's better than my cheesy drawing, <clears throat> all right, of what it looks like. But again, keeping those lone pairs opposite each other is really, really important. If you have a trigonal bipyramid molecule with three lone pairs, they will take on the linear uh, geometry almost all the time, which is really cool. 
Here's a problem that you might see. Um, acetylene is a type of an alkyne from the organic chemistry section. Acetylene, which is also known as ethyne, C2H2. And the question says, what's the approximate CCH angle in acetylene? So what I would do in this problem is I would draw the Lewis structure and see if you can find from the Lewis structure's electron pair geometry what the approximate angle is. So at this point, I recommend you pause the video. When you've answered the question, unpause the video and we'll talk about it. Pause your video now. I'm going to assume that you've worked on the problem and you're ready to check this out, so let's do that. So let's really start from scratch here. Let's say you don't remember that it's a alkyne or anything like that, and you just need to draw the Lewis structure C2H2. Okay, no problem. So again, valence electrons, carbon is four, and there's two of them, and hydrogen is one, and there's two of those. So eight plus two, that's 10 valence electrons, or if you divide that by two, five pairs. Hydrogen can never be in the middle of the molecule. It's always on the outside. And the reason for it, it can only handle one bond, so that's why it's always on the outside. So in this molecule, what I would do is I'd put a hydrogen on the outside. I would put the carbons kind of next to each other and the hydrogen out there. A lot of times carbon likes to make longest chains we talked about. So having carbons next to each other is very, very common. Anyway, we can play around with it from there. So with five pairs, the first thing, you've got to draw a bonding pair between the atoms. That's the glue that holds those atoms together. If you don't draw those, then the atoms flow off and you don't have C2H2, okay? That took up three of my five pairs, so I have two more pairs left to go. And ideally we put them on the outer atoms, but hydrogen doesn't take any more than one bond, so that's not going to happen. So what you could do is put one pair on each atom or two pairs on the same atom, it doesn't matter. But the important part is this part now. Carbon must have an octet, alright? That's not negotiable for us in Chem 222 anyway. Carbon must have an octet and right now each carbon has just one, two, three pairs around it so it's not happy. If you put the other lone pair on the same carbons, that one, that carbon would arguably have an octet but the other carbon would be really deficient. All carbons must have four pairs. So what you're going to do on this structure is you're going to make first a double bond and because the other carbon still doesn't have an Enough, you're end up making a triple bond. So acetylene, like all of the alkynes, is a triply bonded carbon. All right, carbon, carbon, triple bond. So then it says, what's the approximate angle? Well, that let's look at either carbon to figure this out. The carbon's going to have a triple bond to the other carbon and a single bond to the hydrogen. Triple bonds and double bonds count as one cloud. So that carbon is going to have two clouds, a triple bond on one side and a hydrogen on the other. And because the clouds are basically negative electrons, they want to be as far apart from each other as they can. Only two clouds means that's going to be 180 degrees. So acetylene, ethyne, all right, is going to have an HCC angle of 180 degrees due to that triple bond. Triple bond has the bread around the sandwich kind of thing, kind of stacks all on top of each other, but it does count as one cloud. Um, the other angles in there, 109.5 is for tetrahedral electron pair geometries. 100 20 degrees is used for trigonal planar, 90 degrees is usually for octahedral, although trigonal bipyramid does have 90 degrees, 120 degrees, and 180 degrees, so that's a little bit trickier. Um, negative 30 is just for fun. Technically, you can have a negative angle. If you go one way positive, the other way would be negative, but that's an unconventional use of these, um, so probably answer E is just silly. Silly instructor, silly answer, you know, anyway.
Which of the following groups of elements is arranged correctly in order of increasing electronegativity? Electronegativity developed by Linus Pauling is useful to tell when atoms are more than two electrons and less than two electrons. The atom of lowest electronegativity always goes in the middle of the Lewis structure. Anyway, see if you remember um, what's all happening here. And uh, I recommend pausing the video. You can find the correct answer. And then after that, you can unpause it. We'll talk about the right answer. Pause your video now. At this point, I'm assuming you've uh, figured out what your answer is and stuff like that. I also hope that you saw that answer E is actually surprise. All right, really dumb. There is no element S U. So anyway, I need to get a life, I know. But anyway, electronegativity, super important in chemistry, uh, really good to think about. In this case, uh, what you wanna do is remember that, you, first of all, you could look up, if you had access to it, a table of electronegativity values. Fluorine is the most electronegative, negative and as you get farther from it it's less but the other way to do it which I recommend for here is that you just literally think about it as electronegativity increasing up and to the right so of the elements listed you want to follow them on the periodic table start with the lowest left hand corner and work your way to the upper right hand corner of the periodic table and if you do that magnesium is certainly a metal so that's way over on the left hand side compared to the other three then if you go to the right, you'll end up at phosphorus. Then you go up to nitrogen and finally up to fluorine, the most electronegative of all. Answer A here would be the best answer. Answer A definitely shows electronegativity increasing up and to the right, which is what we'd expect. And remember that fluorine is the most electronegative of all. <laughs> so if there's fluorine's ever a chance, fluorine has to be the most electronegative answer. Cool. What is the carbon-oxygen bond order in formaldehyde, CH2O? Formaldehyde is the simplest of the aldehydes from organic chemistry, so uh, this would be a good kind of question to ask. If you remember about aldehydes, this may be an easy question for you, but if you don't, draw out the Lewis structure and see if you can tell what the carbon-oxygen bond order is. At this point, I recommend pausing the video. You can work on the question, and when you're ready, you can unpause the video. We'll talk about the answer answer. Pause your video now. I'm going to assume that you've worked on this question and you're ready to see what the answer is. Fantastic. So if you know what formaldehyde is, this should be pretty chill. But if you don't know, and that's totally fine, always start by, yes, you named it, drawing the Lewis structure, which we're going to do over and over and over again. So starting with the Lewis structure with the valence electrons, carbon is four, hydrogen is one, and there's two of them, plus six for the oxygen. So four plus two plus six, that's that's 12 valence electrons or six pairs. Now, hydrogen cannot go in the middle. And so what I would try to do here is start by writing something like this where you have carbon in the middle. Carbon is happier being in the middle than anything. Oxygen can be in the middle, but it's not as happy doing it. And now what I've done here is I've used up three of my pairs to make the bonding pairs between them. We have six pairs left. Initially, it looks like oxygen will have three pairs around it to make, give it an octet. But again, carbon needs to have an octet, four pairs. So when all is said and done, you're gonna make a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen. And like all of the aldehydes and ketones for that matter, with the carbonyl, carbon-oxygen double bond is really common. Now, bond order usually just means number of bonds between the atoms. So the carbon-hydrogen bond order would be one because it's a single bond. But in this molecule, carbon-oxygen is a double bond, bond order two. So anytime you have a double bond, bond order two, good to go. What is the average carbon-oxygen bond order in the formate ion, HCO2 minus one? So this is another bond order question, but this time it's about average bond order. So at this point, what I would do is see if you can answer this question, pause the video, work on it, and when you're ready, you can unpause it. We'll talk about the answer. Pause the video now. 
I'm gonna assume that you've tried the problem and you're ready to listen to the answer, so let's get into it. The formate ion HCO2-1 is a little bit strange at first to draw, but you kinda of need to do the Lewis structure for the formate ion unless you remember what it is. So when you add up the valence electrons, hydrogen is one, carbon is four, oxygen six, and there's two of them, plus an additional negative one for the negative one charge, you're going to have one plus four plus 12 plus one, that's 18 electrons or nine pairs around the central atom. And like we saw earlier, I would recommend trying to put carbon in the middle. Carbon is a good central atom, you're going to see. Oxygen, not as good as the other one. Now, I'm gonna to skip to the punchline here. When you draw this out, one of the oxygens will be double bonded, and the other oxygen will have a single bond. And so this molecule with a negative one charge is the formate ion. And you can check, uh, count up the number of pairs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine pairs, we're good to go. Um, what we can see now is that you've got a double bond O and a single bond O. And at first, it looks like you'd have a bond order of two when it's a double bond O and a bond order of one when it's a single bond. But notice how it says average. This is a molecule that resonates. You don't have to draw the double bond below. Like you could just as well have the double bond to the other oxygen. You'd have a single bond down there you'd still have your hydrogen this is an example of what it means when something resonates sometimes people will draw little double-sided arrows like that sorry my drawing is really cheesy on this thing but anyway you don't have a double or a single you don't have a single or a double it's a mix or a hybrid or an average of the two so if it resonates you take the total number of bonds that are resonating and you divide them by the number of places they can go. So because we have a double and a single bond, that means there's going to be three bonds that are involved in resonating. And those three bonds can go two different places. This is going to be a bond order of 1.5. And there's a little picture showing in better detail than my cheesy picture that it does resonate. The double bond O is initially on the top in that little picture, and then it moves to the right. And it goes back and forth and back back and forth and back and forth. So when resonance happens, it's total bonds involved in resonance divided by the number of places they can go, 1.5. Given the bond association enthalpies below, calculate the standard molar enthalpy of formation for NF3. And it shows the reaction there. This is a heat of formation, which means one mole of product only, and reactants are elements in their standard states. So because these are both diatomics, we have to use the fractions, one half and three halves. Even I have to use fractions. I hate fractions, but anyway, that's my own problem. Anyway, in this kind of problem, what we're going to do is a problem we talked about in lecture where you take the bonds that are broken and you subtract the bonds that are formed. So what I would do to solve this problem is I would first draw the Lewis structures for N2, F2, and NF3. And from there, bonds broken means the reactants. You're going to break the reactant bonds. And from that, you subtract the bonds that are formed, which are the products. Products, all right. This is the one time in this first midterm you will need a calculator because in order to calculate bonds broken minus bonds formed, you're going to need the numbers. So at this point, I definitely recommend that you pause the video, work on the problem, see if you can get one of those answers using the table right there. When you're ready, unpause the video and we'll talk about the answer. Pause the video now. At this point, I'm assuming you've worked on the problem and you want to check it out, which is totally fine. So let's get into the problem and see what's happening. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to draw the Lewis structures to figure out what you've got. Um, nitrogen, N2, is going to have a triple bond between it. We talked about that earlier in an earlier problem. So that's going to be the NN triple bond. F2, when you draw out its Lewis structure, has a single bond. So F2, you're going to 
break a fluorine fluorine single bond and then NF3 nitrogen trifluoride the nitrogen is in the middle of three fluorines the fluorines have a filled octet around them and the nitrogen has a lone pair now that we have the Lewis structures, we can figure out which of those numbers we're going to use. And remember, it's bonds broken minus bonds formed. So we're going to break an NN triple bond and an FF single bond. So 946 plus 159 would be that part. And then it's bonds broken minus bonds formed. And the bonds formed are the products. Now NF3 has three NF single bonds. So that that means we're going to take that 272 and multiply it by 3. And that's what we subtract from the other two values. So when you do all of this, and I'm going to let you do this in your calculator, you're going to take 1 half times the N2, because it's only 1 half of N2, not the full one. You'll take 3 halves, or 1.5 times the FF single bond. And from the bonds broken, you'll subtract the three NF bonds that you're forming. And there's all the different numbers thrown in. The delta H negative 105 kilojoules per mole, answer B. So this is an exothermic reaction. Nitrogen trifluoride wants to be made from nitrogen and fluorine gas. And again, this is the one time you'll need your calculator. Make sure you uh, see the stoichiometries because they're also part of this. Cool. Which of the following bonds is the least polar? And there's five different possibilities there. Um, ACDC is a band that I like a lot, so that's really not the answer here. I'm just throwing in for a smile. Anyway, see if you can figure out which of the other four, really, it comes down to. It's not ACDC, okay? See if you can figure out which one is least polar. We'll talk about it. Um, pause the video, make your final answer, and then unpause it. We'll talk about the answer. Pause your video now. Okay, at this point, I'm assuming you've worked on the problem and you wanna hear what the answer is, so let's get into it. If you had a table of electronegativity values, you could literally look up the values for each of the atoms up there. And the difference in electronegativities, the delta chi, the smaller delta chi would be the least polar. It's similar, the biggest delta chi would be the most polar. Um, we don't really have a table like that here on this problem. So the next thing you can do is you can literally go through and and pick the two atoms which are closest to each other on the periodic table. And usually that's enough then to tell uh, which one is least polar. So B, C, N, O, and F are all on the second period. And you can probably see that B, C are closest to each other, right? N is next, O is next, and F is farthest away. So B, C is probably going to be the least polar bond. B, F the atoms which are farthest apart would be the most polar. All right, you can kind of use that as a rough guide because generally electronegativity increases up and to the right. So you'd have the smallest difference in electronegativity, excuse me, uh, with the ones that are closest on the periodic table. In the last problem, we looked at the polarity of a bond. In this problem, we're looking for molecular polarity. And in the list below, only one of those molecules is polar. See if you can figure out which one it is. And at this point, I recommend that you pause the video, unpause it when you're ready to talk about it and hear the answer. Pause your video now. Okay, at this point, I'm assuming that you've tried the problem and you want to see what the answer is. So without further ado, let's get into it. If you have two atoms coming together, uh, most of the time, as long as the atoms are different, it will be a polar bond. Like the difference in electronegativity is usually something. However, if the molecule is symmetric, which means that everything around the molecule is connected to the same kind of bond, then the molecule can be nonpolar. 
here. And that's what's happening on a lot of these. So for these, first of all, E is not a molecule at all. That's an atom, right? It's an element on the periodic table. So the answer can't be E. It's not a molecule, all right? Um, but when it comes to A through D, those are all arguably molecules because you have at least two atoms coming together. So what I would do here if, uh, is just write out the Lewis structures and see what's going on. When you do that, only one of them is polar. And here are the four relevant Lewis structures. So let's go through them. BCL3 on the middle right there. Boron is completely surrounded by chlorine. Chlorine is pulling equally uh, in all directions, so they'll cancel out. BCL3 is what I call the symmetric molecule because everything around it is just the same. That one's going to be nonpolar. And carbon dioxide in the middle lower part of the screen. Carbon has a double bondo to the right and a double bondo to the left. Those are equal poles. I talked about how Schwarzenegger would like pull my arms, but if his clone was pulling, it would be the same thing. Well, oxygen is pretty strong in its electronegative pole relative to carbon, but because the oxygens are pulling equal but opposite, then they cancel out. N2, same kind of thing. Nitrogen pulls, but nitrogen pulling on nitrogen is going to cancel out. Only ClF is going to be a polar molecule, all right? Cl is not as electronegative as fluorine. Fluorine pulls a lot more, so fluorine would be the slightly negative side. Chlorine would probably be the slightly positive side. So because they have a difference in electronegativity and it's not symmetric, that's going to be a polar molecule. Which of the following molecules is most likely to have a dipole moment? All right, a dipole moment is something we talked about in lecture and it's gonna come back here in this problem. Why don't you see if you can work on this problem and when you're ready, uh, you can, we'll definitely talk about the answer. Um, pause the video, all right? Do the Lewis structures, whatever you need to do. And when you're ready, you can unpause it. We'll talk about it. Pause your video now. So I'm thinking you're ready to talk about this problem. So without further ado, let's get into it. Um, first thing is that answer E is radon, RN, and radon is an element. So this is not a molecule. RN is disqualified. Sorry, radon. But the other ones, A through D, those are all molecules. Now, the other thing we have to talk about is what the heck is a dipole moment? And believe it or not, polarity is a measurable quantity. They have machines to test uh, polarity and a dipole moment is a measure as to how polar something is. So this question is basically saying which of the following molecules is polar? All right, that's what it has when it has a dipole moment. So one of the molecules A through D is polar and our goal here is to figure out what it is. So again, you've got to draw out the Lewis structure. Symmetric molecules will be nonpolar, but one of these is not not going to be symmetric, i.e. everything around the central atom won't be the same. So when you draw out the Lewis structures, and I'm just going to put them out here, here's the four structures. The lower right corner has CH4, carbon surrounded by hydrogens. Everything around the carbon is the same, nonpolar. SF6, sulfur hexafluoride, is the next one to the left there, the kind of big one. It's octahedral. But again, everything around the sulfur is the same. And if everything is the same around the central atom, it's nonpolar. If you replaced even one of those fluorines with like chlorine or something, that would make the molecule polar, but SF6 is nonpolar. Same thing for beryllium difluoride. Beryllium has a F on both sides of it. There's nothing else around it, no lone pairs. That one's gonna be nonpolar. But nitrogen, most of the time, has a lone pair on it, all right? So nitrogen trifluoride in the lower kind of middle left part there, nitrogen with a lone pair and three fluorines, that's not symmetric. All right, everything around the nitrogen is not the same. If it was like fourth nitrogen where the lone pair is, then it would be symmetric. But a lone pair is different from atoms. So NF3 is polar. NF3 is going to have a measurable dipole moment. Which hybrid orbital set is used by the boron atom in the BCL4 minus one ion? 
Okay, so this is a question relating to valence bond theory and the model. And those terms down there, answers A through E, represent the different possible answers you can have. And it is based on the electron pair geometry. So yes, I would recommend drawing the Lewis structure for BCl4- and then figuring out which of those is correct. At this point, I recommend pausing the video. You can work on the problem. And when you're ready, unpause it and we'll talk about the answer. Pause the video now. I'm going to assume that you've worked on the problem and you're ready to talk about the answer, so let's get into it. So BCl4 minus 1. Boron is an atom that can have less than an octet. It can have just 3. But in this example, boron is going to be the regular kind of atom with a filled octet. And when you draw out the Lewis structure, you'll see that BCl4 minus is a boron in a tetrahedral environment. And anytime you have a tetrahedral electron pair geometry, the hybridization is described as sp3. So boron in a tetrahedral environment, like anything in a tetrahedral environment, sp3. So again, the key to figuring these out is drawing the Lewis structures, look at the electron pair geometry, you're good to go. This molecule right here is cysteine. It's one of the natural amino acids. And what I'd like you to do is figure out the number of sigma bonds and the number of pi bonds in the molecule. All right, so count them up and see which one is right. So at this point, I recommend you pause the video, see if you can figure out the answer. And when you're ready, you can unpause it. We'll talk about the answer. Pause the video now. I'm going to assume that you've worked on the problem and you're ready to talk about it, so let's get into it. So let's talk about sigma and pi. Um, in this problem, the double bond O is the one that's kind of interesting here. And a double bond occurs because you had a sigma bond first, but to make all the electrons work out, you ended up making a double bond. And the second bond in a double bond is a pi bond. So you can see that all the answers there have one pi bond, all right? One of those two lines is the pi bond, all right? But the other line in there is a sigma. So let's count up here how many sigmas there are. One, two. Each single bond is a sigma bond. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and one more right there. 13 sigma bonds and one pi bond. So there's 14 bonds total, all right? Double bond equals sigma plus pi. Don't forget that sigma if you're counting it up. A triple bond would be one sigma bond and two pi bonds. But a double bond, which is arguably more common, would be one sigma and one pi. Good to go. This is cysteine again, and you can see there that there are three angles highlighted. So angle one is an HSC angle, angle two is an OCO angle, and angle three, HNH angle. See if you can figure out the values of the angles for angles one, two, and three. At this point, pause the video, work on the problem, and when you're ready, unpause it, and we'll talk about it. Pause your video now. At this point, I'm assuming you've uh, done the problem and you want to hear the answer, so let's take care of business. On these problems, you want to find the electron pair geometry of the central atom, and that's really, really important, all right? So for example, if you look at angle one right there, it looks like from the drawing, HSC, it's going to be 180 degrees. It totally looks that way, right? Our drawings, though, often will lie to us. And this is where analysis of a Lewis structure with Vesper geometry is really important. That sulfur has two lone pairs and two bonding pairs, four clouds total. And things that have four clouds are not 180 degrees, they're 109 degrees. So angle one is 109 degrees, not 180. So if you put down 180, I totally understand 
understand, but angle one is 109, is tetrahedral. Our drawings will lie to us. Same thing with two and three. Now in angle two, that carbon in the middle has a double bond and two single bonds, a single bond to the carbon and a single bond to the oxygen. Double bonds, as well as triple bonds, count as one cloud. So that carbon in angle two has three clouds. That's a trigonal planar electron pair geometry. And trigonal planar bonds, 120. Angle two is 120 degrees. Now, angle three kind of looks like it's 90, but oh, trust me, it's not. Because that nitrogen has three single bonds and one lone pair, four clouds total. And just like on angle one, this is also going to be 109 degrees. So of all of those answers there, answer B would be right. One and three angles are around tetrahedral, so they're about 109. Angle two is trigonal planar, so that's why it's 120 degrees. Don't look at just the drawings to figure it out. You've got to analyze what's happening in your head. That's why angle one is not 180, angle three is not 90, or angle two for that matter. Uh, you got to think about things in terms of Vesper geometry. Nitrogen can lose an electron to form N2 plus. What is the bond order of N2 plus? Okay, this kind of question could arguably be answered through either a Lewis structure or molecular orbital theory. But for this question, I would like you to do a molecular orbital analysis of N2 plus. This kind of problem is pretty easy with MO because you can build neutral N2 and then in this case, subtract an electron to see what's going on. Lewis structures, you'd have to use dotted lines and it's not as much fun. So anyway, in this problem, see if you can use molecular orbital theory to figure out what the bond order is of N2+. And I definitely recommend that you pause the video at this point, work on it, and when you've got an answer, you can unpause it and we'll talk about the answer. All right, so pause your video now. I'm gonna assume that you've worked on the problem and you're ready to talk about it, so without further ado, let's do this. So in molecular orbital theory, which is the best way to answer this question, when you have nitrogen, you want to use what I called in lecture the 2121 pattern, which means the pi 2p orbitals are first, then the sigma 2p, then pi star 2p, and sigma star 2p. Nitrogen is no, by default 2p3, so so you'd have three plus three, six electrons in neutral N2. But in N2 plus, you're gonna take away one of those electrons, you'll only have five electrons in the 2P. So anyway, when you do this, I've shown a picture here of neutral N2. And neutral N2 has a pattern here of uh, the core electrons, then sigma 2s2, which are those right there, sigma star 2s2, here's the pi 2p4, and finally then on the very top part, sigma 2p2. Two. There's the shorthand notation and the regular version. However, that's for neutral N2. And we want here neutral, excuse me, we want N2 plus one. We want to remove an electron from the highest occupied molecular orbital, the HOMO. That's going to be this sigma 2p. So right here is the electron configuration for N2 plus. And on the middle diagram, you can think about it like taking out that one. Just cross that one out. There's only a single electron there in N2+. So bond order in molecular orbital diagrams, one half bonding minus anti-bonding electrons. The bonding and anti-bonding for the sigma 2s and sigma 2s star uh, cancel out because you have just as many bonding as anti-bonding, so you can just use the top. One half parentheses, five bonding electrons, no anti-bonding electrons, 2.5 is the bond order for N2+. 
So that's how you figure these things out. Start with a neutral atom. If it's positive, it means take away electrons. If it's negative, you add electrons and you can find bond order from there. And hopefully you can also see the utility of the shorthand notation. I uh, was unable to find a picture of N2 plus's molecular orbital diagram and I was a little too lazy, I guess, to draw one myself. So anyway, I've got to cheese it out here. Shorthand notation, awesome. Anyway, instructor is getting too excited, so better go on to the next question. N2 plus, is it diamagnetic or paramagnetic? So remembering this picture we just saw, see if you can answer that. Uh, 42, the answer C is of course silly. Um, 42 refers to uh, a book and a movie, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is another whole story. But anyway, the, bra the answer will be either A or B, and you have to use the last diagram to figure that out. Pause the video if you need to, work on it, and when you're ready, you can unpause it. We'll talk about the answer. Pause the video now. I'm assuming you've worked on the problem and we can go back into it, so let's do it. N2 plus had a total of five bonding electrons. Four of them were in the pi 2p and N2 plus had just a single bonding electron in sigma 2p. And that single electron is enough to make the whole molecule paramagnetic. So I've just put in the shorthand notation up here. Score sigma 2s2, sigma star 2s2, those were filled up. Pi 2p4, those are the filled uh, pi 2p's, and then sigma 2p1. And that single electron there is enough to make the whole thing paramagnetic. Neutral N2 had sigma 2p2. That would be a diamagnetic thing, but if there's even one unpaired electron, that's enough to make the whole thing paramagnetic. What is the bond order of the superoxide ion? And superoxide is a weird ion of oxygen. It's O2 minus one. For this problem, I recommend using molecular orbital theory once again. I would start off with neutral oxygen, and in case of O2 minus one, I would add an additional electron to see what the bond order is. Um, at this point, I recommend you pause the video and work on the problem. When you're ready, unpause it, then we'll talk about the answer, pause your video now. I'm assuming you want to talk about the problem, so without further ado, let's get into it. Now, oxygen, neutral O2, is a different molecular orbital diagram from N2, which we just went through. Oxygen, like fluorine and neon, is a 1, 2, 2, 1 diagram, which means sigma 2p is first, then the two pi 2p's are next, then the two pi star 2p, and then finally the one sigma star 2p. So for this question, in the lower left hand corner once again neutral O2 and we talked about this in problem set number two but here it is again now this is for neutral O2 and O2 minus one we need to add one more electron to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital so in either of the pi star 2p orbitals you want to add an electron and I added mine on the right if you add yours on the left that's no big deal so notice that we're adding an anti-bonding electron, which is kind of interesting. But bond order, once again, one half bonding minus anti-bonding. The bonding and anti-bonding in the sigmas cancel out, so we don't have to worry about that. One half the six bonding electrons minus now the three anti-bonding, bond order 1.5. So again, molecular orbital diagrams are great for figuring out all this stuff for the ions, this would be a lot more interesting slash difficult if it was just a regular Lewis structure. This question is about naming molecules, and here's a molecule from organic chemistry that I'd like you to try and find the name. Um, this is a question, again, based on the rule, remember, uh, longest chain, shortest number, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, see if you can figure this out. I recommend you pause the video, and when you're done, you can unpause it. We'll talk about the answer. Pause the video now. Okay, at this point, I'm assuming you're ready to look at the answer, so without further ado, let's get into it. Um, if you count up the total number of carbons, there are nine, and no name, 
alkane is the name of an alkane with nine hydrogens. And remember, all the alkanes, you take the alkyl group and add hydrogen to it. So the nonal group plus hydrogen would be no name. No name would be a possibility. However, this is an isomer of no name. No name or N no name would be nine carbons in a row. And they're all sp3 tetrahedral stuff like that. This one is certainly not nine carbons in a row. So what we have to do on a problem like this then is once we realize it's not no name but an isomer of no name, we need to look for the longest chain of carbon atoms and we also need to find the smallest number. So one thing you might do is because we live in America, all right, uh, where we read left to right, you might be tempted to circle this part right here and you'd say, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. It would be a hexane, okay? And a hexane has a methyl group above and an ethyl group below that aren't uh, in the chain. So you could call it alphabetically ethyl first, methyl second, two ethyl, because one, two, three, four, five, six, if you count left to right, uh, two ethyl, five methyl. You could also call it uh, two methyl, five ethyl, but usually smaller numbers go first. So two ethyl, five methyl would be right. And that would certainly be one name for this molecule. However, a lot of times the drawings will lie to us. So let me erase that and let me show you a weird twist. In the way that this molecule was written, you can actually get a longer set of carbon atoms by circling this group right here. And if you do that, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. Seven carbons is a heptane, all right, not a nonane, but a heptane. No problem. So seven is better than six. Longest chain is best. This is going to be a heptane, not a hexane. Okay. Now for numbering, if you look at the way I've numbered, there's a methyl group off the third carbon and a methyl group off the sixth carbon. So you could absolutely call this three, six dimethyl heptane. All right. And that would be fine. However, remember what I said is that when you're starting this, you should always count in both directions to see if you get a smaller one. So I'm going to put an underline by the 3,6-dimethylheptane, and let's see if we can get a little bit better. So let me clear my screen here again. I'm going to circle my heptane again right there. And before what I did is I started in the bottom and I went towards the top. But now what I want to do is I want to start on the top right and count the chain this way. And there's five, six, seven. So I still have seven. It's still a heptane. And if you look now at where the, oh, by the way, E was circled, underlined from before. Anyway, if you look at this now, the methyl groups are now at the second carbon and the fifth carbon right there. So another name for this crazy thing would be 2,5-dimethylheptane. Before we had 3,6-dimethylheptane. And also, like we talked about in lecture, in addition to longest chain, you want smallest numbers. So the very best name for this beast, 2,5-dimethylheptane. Let me clear all this out here. There we go. You can see. So now in red, I have the heptane. Heptane. In blue, I have the two methyls. All right. Notice that in this way I drew it, I started with one here, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No problem. In the way I drew it before, I didn't have the blue CH3 on the right. I circled the top CH3, but it doesn't matter. Same name. The important part about this problem is that, first of all, it shows the importance of longest chain. So heptane, and sometimes the drawings lie to us. You got to wrap them around sometimes. But the other thing that's really cool is it shows smallest number. And 2,5 is smaller than 3,6. 2,5-dimethylheptane, oh joy of organic chemistry.
Here's a compound, four statements. Only one of them is correct. See if you can find out which one is right. And at this point, I recommend pausing the video. You can read through them, figure out which one you think is best. And when you're ready, you can unpause it and we'll talk about it. Pause your video now. At this point, I'm assuming you've worked on the problem, you wanna hear the answer, so let's check it out. So the first part of all these statements say that the compound is an isomer of something, all right? And to figure out what the something is, you just need to count the number of carbons in the structure. And those struct the structure there has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. And if it's six carbons, it's going to be an isomer of hexane. And by the way, it's more than just six carbons, all the carbons are tetrahedral sp3 with only hydrogen. If you had oxygen in there or you had a double bond, that wouldn't count. So because these are all uh, tetrahedral sp3 with just hydrogen, that's why it's an isomer of an alkane. Okay, so we know that the answer is going to be C or D. Pentane would be only five carbons and octane on B would be eight carbons. So in C and D, then the other parts say, and it's named either 2,2-dimethylbutane or 3,3-dimethylbutane butane. Well, again, circle, um, figure out the longest chain of carbon atoms. And the longest chain you can probably imagine is going to be four. There we go. My thing is working. So there's four carbons. If you count left to right, one, two, three, four. So the two methyl groups are off the third carbon. So three, three dimethyl butane might be tempting. But remember, when you're learning especially, count both directions. So if you count right to left, this would be one, two, three, four. You can see that if you count right to left, the methyl groups are both off the second carbon. So this compound is best called 2,2-dimethylbutane. So it's an isomer of hexane because, first of all, there's six carbons, everything's tetrahedral, sp3 with only hydrogens, no oxygens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's 2,2-dimethylbutane because if you count right to left, you get 2,2. It might be tempting to call it 3,3, but you won't see that if you count both ways. 2 is smaller than 3. You want to use the 2,2 two version version, not the 3-3. Three, three. Cool. Here are four compounds, and the question is which one or ones could be an alkane? So see if you can figure out which of those answers is correct. I recommend pausing the video. You can think about it, and when you're ready, unpause it, and we'll talk about the answer. Pause the video now. Okay, at this point, I'm assuming you've worked on the problem and you wanna talk about it, so let's get into it. If you have an alkane, there's a generic formula which can be used to describe it. And if you remember from alkane, our discussion of it, an alkane is CnH2n plus two. CnH2n plus 2. So what that means is for every n carbons, you're going to have 2n plus 2 hydrogens. So for C3H6, n would be 3. 3 times 2 plus 2. 8 would be the number. So C3H8 will not be an alkane. If you have 3 carbons, you need 8 hydrogens to be an alkane. Um, notice how that's a 2 to 1 hydrogen to carbon ratio, C3H6. C7H14, same thing. So that one's not going to be an alkane. You can do, confirm that. N would be 7, 7 times 2, 14 plus 2, 16 hydrogens, not going to fly. Now, number 3, N is 11. So 2 times 11, 22 plus 2, ah, C11. 11H24 could be an alkane. Absolutely. Um, the last one, C7H8, you can see there's not even close to enough hydrogens for carbon to be an alkane. So in this one, only number three is going to be an alkane. That CNH2N plus two formula can be really helpful. This is just one way and stuff to kind of see it. The other ones we're going to see are different kinds of compounds. Here's a molecule. See if you can figure out which of those would be the best name for this molecule. And at this point, I recommend pausing the video. When you're ready, unpause it. We'll talk about the answer. Pause the video now. 
I'm gonna assume that you've worked on the problem, you wanna talk about it, let's get into it. We're seeing here different classes of compounds. Um, butanoic acid is a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acids do have an OH, but they also have a carbonyl, a C double bond O. So carboxylic acids have the oic acid ending, and they have a C double bond O, OH on the end. It's definitely not A. B, an aldehyde ending means it's an aldehyde. Butanal would have an aldehyde, which is a C double bond O next to a hydrogen. Well, this doesn't have a C double bond O. It's definitely not an aldehyde. The last one, butane, is an alkane. Alkanes have just carbons and hydrogens, no oxygen. So this uh, structure is definitely not butane. So you can probably imagine that this structure is going to be an alcohol. Yeah, alcohols have an O-L ending on the end. Now the first one is butanol. And it is a four-carbon alcohol, which is a butanol. However, the number can be really important in these because in the structure we have, the OH is off the second carbon, but you could have an OH off the first carbon as well. So the number is really important, and the new school way of writing alcohols would be the alkane name without the E, the number, and OL. So butantool would be the official fancy name for this molecule. If you called it 2-butanol, I am totally happy with you. That's the way I grew up talking about organic chemistry chemistry, but butan 2 all is kind of the cooler name these days. So just remember the number. All right, it's not enough to say it's butanol because you could have a 1-butanol or a 2-butanol. Correction, butan 1 all, butan 2 all, but you get the idea. Numbering becomes really important in these. Here's another molecule. Let's see if we can figure out what this one is. Again, it's another four carbon system, so it's gonna have a butte something in it. Anyway, figure it out. Um, pause the video. When you're ready, unpause it. We'll talk about it. Pause the video now. Okay, I'm gonna assume you've worked on it. You wanna talk about it, so let's get into it. So this structure, four carbons is but, and it's got a double bond O, a carbonyl, in the middle of the carbons, and that's gonna be important. So like we saw in the last problem, butanoic acid is a carboxylic acid. It does have a C double bond O, but there's no OH next to it. So this structure is not butanoic acid. Um, let's skip to C, an amine, has a nitrogen in it. There's no nitrogen in this structure, so it's not C. D is an alcohol. We saw that structure for butan 2 all earlier. It's an OH off the second one. This doesn't have an OH, so it's not butan 2 all So with a carbonyl only, it's most likely an aldehyde, which is answer B, or a ketone, answer E. Both aldehydes and ketones have the carbonyl, but the difference is, is that the aldehyde has at least one hydrogen adjacent to the carbonyl. So if there was a hydrogen next to the C double bond O, then it could be an aldehyde. But this compound has a carbonyl with a carbon on both the left and the right. It's like a methyl group on the left and an ethyl group on the right, alkyl groups on both sides of the carbonyl, and that always means it's a ketone. This is butanone. Butanone is a ketone with four carbons total. Uh, it's like butane, but O-N-E, pretty cool. If the C double bond O was on the end and there was a hydrogen next to it, that would be butanol. So you'd have like CH3, CH2, CH2, and then C double bond O, H, that would be butanol, but this is butanone. They're very similar, but subtle differences. Here's another molecule. See if you can figure out which of those is the right name for this molecule. Pause the video, and when you're ready, you've got an answer, you can unpause it, we'll talk about it. Pause the video now. 
I'm gonna assume that you've worked on it, you're ready to talk about it, so let's get into it. So first of all, this molecule has a C double bond OOH on the end of it, and that means it's a carboxylic acid. All right, these are all weak acids that are pretty handy. And uh, if you count the number of carbons in this structure, there's one, two, three, four, five. Five is a pent group. So the first one, butanoic acid, isn't gonna work. Butanoic acid would only have four carbons to it. If you go down this structure, this list, pentanal would be an aldehyde, which would be a C double bond O on the end, which we do have. However, instead of having an OH, you would have just a hydrogen there. So it's not pentanal. And pentanone is a ketone. We saw earlier that's a carbonyl in the middle of other carbons. That's not what this is. The last one, pentan one all or one pentanol, would be an OH on the end, but no double bond O you'd have just the OH. So this one, probably no big surprise, pentanoic acid. And again, number one is the carbon with the carboxylic acid group goes to five carbons total, you're good to go. Butanoic acid would have only four carbons total. So they pull out one of the CH2s in the middle essentially to make butanoic acid. Okay, that's the end of this review. I hope it was helpful to you. Um, if you need more practice before the midterm, please remember there are a whole series of practice problem sets. They're both online and in the companion. There are concept guides in the companion and online. There's chapter guides. Uh, there are online resources of information. The textbook itself has end of chapter questions that will help, and every other question has the answer at the end. I definitely wish you the best with your studying. Uh, you're welcome to email me if you have any questions or talk to the Learning Success Center slash Avid Center at Mount Hood. They can help too. Good luck with your studying.